The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. The story of Mehitable Wing. Adapted for radio from a story by the noted American author, Carl Carmer. With Jeanette Nolan in the role of Mehitable Wing. Tonight, the DuPont Company, makers of Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry, bring you the story of a valiant heroine of 18th century America, Mehitable Wing. And here's Dr. Frank Monahan, professor of history at Yale University, the cavalcade of America's historical advisor. Dr. Monahan. It seems to me that history has too long neglected Mehitable Wing. Tonight, we are going to remedy that injustice. We are fortunately able to do so because of discoveries made by Carl Carmer while writing his recent book called The Hudson. The woman to whom Cavalcade now pays tribute made one of the most remarkable horseback rides in American history. I think that her ride is as notable as the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Beyond its inherent dramatic charm, the story of Mehitable Wing is symbolic of an important movement in American history, the struggle of the people to own the land upon which they live. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Our sovereign lord, the king, strictly charges and commands all manner of persons to keep silence upon pain of imprisonment. His lordship, Justice Horsmanden, this day, the 6th of August, in the year of our lord, 1766, the court of king's bench is in session. It is midsummer in the Hudson Valley, the year 1766. The little courthouse at Poughkeepsie is thronged with excited valley farmers. One of their neighbors, William Prendergast, is on trial for his life. On the prisoner's bench is the handsome Irish-born William. Beside him, in gray Quaker dress, is his wife, Mehitable. Go now, my wife. Here's the judge. I want to stay by there, William. Besides, there's no other seat empty. It is not fit for you to stay here, nor speak out so freely in the court. The judge didn't mind. He has kind eyes, William. He smiled at me. Little pigeon, it is not for the judge I want you to sit down in court, but for the prosecutor. It's plain he resents you. Well, I can't admire the king's counsel, William. We'll need both our wits against him. Better I stay close by thee and hear his words plainly. Uh, I ask indulgence from the jury and the king's counsel for this delay. I, my Hessian mayor was in full, and I trusted no hand but my own to superintend the business. Let King's counsel proceed from point of interruption. My lord, the prisoner has not yet pleaded to this indictment. Please, my lord. My husband and I have been advised by our friends that his case is bound up with other farmers in the valley. We hope this is for his advantage. My lord, is there nothing I can plead besides guilty or not guilty? There is no other plea. Your lordship's wisdom will be deeper than the King's counsel. My husband wants a plea in the middle Sitting for an honest man who has done a thing for which he is neither guilty nor not guilty. Uh, this Quaker woman does waste the court's time, your lordship. The prisoner will answer yea or nay. William Pendergast, you're accused of having uttered seditious words, of having incited honest men to riot and rebellion, of having set yourself up as captain of a rebel army, of having broken into prison, of having inflicted outrage upon the king's office holders, of thievery and property of property and high treason. How plead you? Guilty or not guilty? So be it. Not guilty. Is it pity, your lordship, that the law forces William to plead in such a way? Uh, your lordship, I move that the prisoner's wife be removed from the court, lest she too much influence the jury. She does not disturb the court, nor does she speak unreasonably. Uh, your lordship, I, I do not think she should speak at all. I, I fear her very looks may wrongly influence the jury. Denied. For the same reason, you might as well move the prisoner cover himself with a veil. <laughs> I thank you, your lordship. Your lordship, as counsel for the crown, I will prove beyond doubt this is a clear case from beginning to end. We have witnesses... But, your lordship, it is not a clear case. It is as we tell thee, William is neither guilty... Your lordship, we have witnesses to establish every charge in the indictment. We will prove that the prisoner did... William is neither guilty nor not guilty, your lordship. We must hear our story, for it is the truth. I object, your lordship... This woman has no standing in this court. She is not counsel for the accused. I do but wish the court to hear the truth. Someone must speak it. 
Tis plain the king's council does not know it. <laughs> Your lordship, must king's council endure these constant interruptions which serve only to confuse the jury? Uh, well, would it not be better to let her have her say and be done with it? Mistress Prendergast, the court will allow you to tell your story if it has relevance. Does king's council wish to question her? The crown, your lordship, can quickly dispose of this matter, for it is plain she knows little of it. First, let us consider the plea. <clears throat> Mehitable Prendergast, you intimate that the prisoner's plea is inexact. If this is so, why has he not thrown himself upon the mercy of the court? I suspect others here would answer as I, sir. We look upon thy case and find no mercy in it. <laughs> you see, your lordship, she but delays the court with digression. Answer my question. I cannot, sir, if you interrupt me. Well, perhaps there will be fewer digressions if Mrs. Pendergast told her story in her own way. Well, then, I must go back to the morning William proposed to me. Oh, my dear, such a thing has no place at this trial. But it has, William. Else he would not be here. Mrs. Pendergast, address your words to the court. Yes, my lord. But my husband would not be in this trouble but for me. Your lordship, I belong in this obvious attempt to gain sympathy for the accused. You know, I'd... The witness may proceed without interruption. Thank you, sir. Well, here is exactly how it was. On the morning I speak of, William came to Quaker Hill and held private converse with my father. Snow was falling outside. I was in the kitchen. It was early in the morning, and I was cooking Commentary. porridge on the hearth. I heard William stamping the snow from his feet outside. Good morning, Mehitable. Good morning, William. Come, sit by the hearth and make thyself warm. Would be like some hot porridge? I have no appetite for it, Mehitable. I've just left your father. We parted in anger. Anger? Oh, William. What did they say to him? I asked his permission to make him my wife. He refused it. Oh? Well, I thank you for telling me of it, sir. Oh, Mehitable. Your eyes are like a lake I once saw in the woods. Would you have said yes to me, Mahidabu? I would have said yes to thee, William. Then my pigeon will wed without your father's blessing. Oh, no. I cannot depart my father's house in anger. He said I had no way to take care of it. Thy strong hands can build our world. We have not spoken fully to father. I told him plainly I'd wed no other, and I meant it, Mahidabu. No, no, I mean about the land we could rent from the manor lord Philip. Did they talk of that? What land? That little woodland at the foot of the hill. That part by the brook he told me would be fertile. Yes, it would be. If I chopped away the trees. Yes. Timber for a cabin. But are you sure Philip will lease it? My father said so, William. I think I'll have another talk with your father. Wait, William. Wouldn't it be better to see Manor Lord Philip first? Have the lease in thy pocket. And then speak to father. Yes. Yes, my pigeon. That's exactly what I'll be doing. I'll go to my lord first. And then I'll be seeing your father. And I'll soon be telling you what he said. And so, gentlemen, after our little talk, several days passed, and then William leased a few acres of land for Manor Lord Phillips. And we took each other with joy and care. But we had come by our lease without realizing some of the terms set down on the paper. And when we finally realized what they meant, we saw that they were unfair. So one day we went to Manor Lord Philip's great house and waited long before we were admitted to see him. He was alone at his desk, and it was late in the afternoon. We wanted to tell him why we thought the lease was unfair and what we wanted done in justice to our family. I have a little time for you. Came to ask you, my lord, to change our lease. Change your lease? Yes, my lord. Now, what do you take me for, friendly guest? Your four pounds, twelve shillings due today. Well... We're a pound short, my lord. It was a poor crop. Yeah, you would cheat me out of a pound, eh? And expect me to change the lease? It's not a question of cheating. The terms of that lease are unbearable. Unbearable? Well, you signed it and you live up to it. Or take your wife and yourself off my land. That is the law and you know it. It is an unfair lease, my lord. And we protested. So you protested, Mistress Prendergast. Well, now what's that commotion out there? My lord. What is it, Sheriff? Lieutenant Monroe, who's been evicted from his farm, my lord. 
He and two others demand to see you. Monroe, eh? Well, what do I pay you for? Arrest the blackguard. Put him in the stock. My lord, we've come to ask you to... Get out! What do you mean, breaking in here like this? We ask you to give Samuel Monroe his farm back. Yes, and lower all our rents, if you will, my lord. Why, you beggars. I should arrest you for trying to get out of your just debt. But please, my lord, they are not just debt. We are honest men, my lord. But is it just to make each of us pay you more rent than you pay to the crown? Just? I am the one to decide justice here. Sign those leases and you'll abide by them. My lord. For all of your 50,000 acres. Hold your we tongue, We have to pay you more than that ourselves. And for a lot less than 50,000 acres. Four pounds, 12 shillings for 50,000 acres. Is that all he pays? That's all. Hear these beggars out of here. Right. Out of my house, I say, and off my premises. You too, friend of guest. And take your wife with you. Go on, clear out. And don't forget, friend of guest. You still owe me for the rent. We'll see about that. Mehitable. William, please. What is it they would do? You heard, you heard it all in there. For our little farm, he makes me pay four pounds, 12 shillings. And for four pounds, he holds 50,000 acres. I heard it all, William. You ask me what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell every farmer along the Hudson of this robbery. I'll take to the road. I'll... I heard, William. But I heard him, too, speak of the law. Ah, the law. It is as he says. No good can come of breaking it. Miss Hittable, I love you. But this is no time for turning your Quaker cheek. No, I'll tell my story at every farmhouse and crossroads from here to the end of the valley. Men, men, listen to me. All right, all right. If we're free men, we quit the plow and take up our muskets now. Are you with me? All right, all right. All right. Then come on, come on. Let's not wait. We've a lot to do. You, Monroe, go up the river. You, Whitey, go back into the hills. John, you take the king's road. The rest of you, come with me. And the men agreed with William and what he said. That is the truth, Your Lordship, and the way it was. You see, Your Lordship, Mistress Pendergast admits her husband's treason. Does the woman still insist on continuing? If I may, Your Lordship. Proceed. William said goodbye to me, and though I told him over and over that trouble would come, he rode off that day with his men, and I knew he would not be back by sundown. But I heard later what happened, and this is the way it was. Ah, then, Mistress Pendergast, you admit you were not present at what followed. No, I was not, but it is the truth. I object, Your Lordship. This evidence is only hearsay. Objection sustained. But William was there. William, be tell of it. Well, I... Prendergast, is it not true that you gathered hundreds of men into a rebel army? Well, maybe it was hundreds, but it was no army. Only honest farmers who felt as I, that we'd been set upon. We make the soil sweet by our own labor and want to pass it on to our sons. And isn't it true that with this army, you attacked a jail at Poughkeepsie, inflicted outrage upon the king's office holders? Well, I... The accused will answer the question. Well, maybe we did that too, Your Lordship. We... I don't know what good the telling of this will do for me, but it seemed good at the time. At any rate, we went to the home of Justice Peters, who has thrown many an honest man into jail, Your Lordship. Well, a couple of the lads and myself give them a ducking in the pound town pump, that's all. <laughs> and if I do say it, Your Lordship, the old billy goat needed it badly, and that's the truth. I, I must warn the accused not to refer to the esteemed Justice Peters as an old billy goat. <laughs> Proceed. That's all, Your Lordship. If I may continue, Your Lordship. Mr. Spindergast. All this while, I was waiting at my father's house. For it, it was my time. Then I learned the king's troops were hunting for William. William and his men were in hiding on Quaker Hill in the meeting house. So in the night, I went there, and I asked William to give himself up. I told him that even if everything else in our world was wrong, truth should prove him right in a court of justice. That's probably all there is to our story, Your Lordship. I... I thank you, Lordship, for hearing us. Does the... The King's Counsel wish to introduce further evidence in this case? No, Your Lordship. Mistress Pendergast has proven every charge in the indictment. The Crown rests. As there is no regular counsel for the defense, the court will now proceed with this charge to the jury. At this time, there are positive points the jury should consider when it retires for its deliberation. In the first place, the stress and motives of these times and the people of the Hudson will Hudson Valley, out of such character and turmoil, that the elements of passion and prejudice are most natural. 
William, I know the jury will set thee free. They must. They must, but will they? There's a bitter difference in the words, my pigeon. But I know they will. His lordship's address was honest and fair. They can find but one way, William, and that is for thee. But we'll see. But remember, the jurymen are farmers, all in their own land, not on leases like us. And this is the court of King's Bench. Oh, William. And now we'll know, my pigeon. The jury's ready with its verdict. I pray it's for thee, William. It must be. The court of King's Bench is in session. His lordship, Justice Horsman, and... The jury has completed its deliberation. Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed of your verdict? We are. Prisoner, look upon the jury. William. Steady, my pigeon. Jury, look upon the prisoner. How say you? Is the prisoner at the bar guilty of high treason, whereof he stands indicted, or not guilty? Guilty. No. No. William, no, they can't. The prisoner will come forward to the bench. William Pendergast, have you anything to say before the court passes sentence upon you? I have nothing to say, Your Lordship. Very well. William Pendergast, you stand convicted of high treason against His Majesty. For your offense, you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. This sentence will be executed on the 26th day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1766. God have mercy upon my soul. Court is adjourned. No, no, William. Come along, no. friend Gas. Come along. Goodbye, my pigeon. William, no, it can't be true. I'll speak to his lordship. Wait. This way, friend Gas. Goodbye, my hitable. Goodbye. Your lordship. Your lordship. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. Pendergast. I would speak with thee. Here, here. In my chambers, mistress. This way. I thank thee. Your lordship. Sit down, mistress. Rest yourself. Your lordship. Is there any way they can save William? I am sorry, but the verdict is guilty. The weight of the evidence is too damaging. The sentence is prescribed by law. But the truth must be right. I have told William so many times. It is why I persuaded him to give himself up to justice. And why he believed me, your lordship. Is there no way to save him? Pardon from the king. Pardon from the king? Governor Moore is the only man who might effectively petition the king... And he's in New York, 70 miles away. Then can't we go to him? I'm afraid not. Anyway, I've heard he's ready to start on a long journey. I'm sorry. There is no way, mistress. There must be a way. Heaven help me to find it. Seventy miles away, seventy miles down the shores of the Hudson River, is the residence of the royal governor, Sir Henry Moore. Seventy miles to the tip of Manhattan Island, and astride a white horse, onward through hour after hour of suspense and fear, rides Mehitable. Down the King's Road, past windswept Tapan Bay, past King's Ferry and Tarrytown, on and on until Mehitable pulls up a panting charger at the Harlem River. Then the long gallop over the farmlands of Manhattan Island. On down to the governor's residence, and finally, one and this desperate, the hittable stands before Sir Henry Moore. Please. Please, Excellency. Mistress, I've told you I have no time now. I'm sorry, but you must see me at the appointed time for the hearing of petition. I'm preparing to leave New York. There are many things to do. Come back another time. Excellency, I beg thee. Please. I came by horse all the way from Poughkeepsie. You rode here? For what reason? To beg thee to save my husband's life. He is... He is William Prendergast. Prendergast? Is the trial over? My husband has been sentenced to death. I'm sorry for you, mistress. Sorry Prendergast happens to be your husband. But there is nothing I can do for you. I rode to ask thee to spare him. Oh, be merciful to us. But how can I, mistress? Facts are facts. And the king's justice is the king's justice. William is impetuous, Excellency. Yet what he did, he thought was right. There are hundreds of farmers who feel as William that it was no wrong. The wrong is the rent we pay for our little farms. We speak of the king's justice. If William is hanged, all these farmers will lose hope in justice. 
If there is to be a peace in the valley, we must have true justice. Yes. Perhaps. Perhaps the king might... I entreat thee. Have mercy. Petition his majesty for William's right to live. Mistress, I am much impressed by what you say. You are a loyal and brave woman. Your husband shall not suffer. Oh, thank you, Excellency. Thank you. I will send his majesty a petition for your husband's pardon. And in the meantime, you have my assurance. Your that Excellency. The matter... Yes? Rumor has come that the Valley Farmers are rising again. Valley Farmers rising? For what reason? They resent the outcome of the Prendergast trial. We fear that they'll seize the jail and free him. Oh, no. The no. commanding officer asked your permission to embark troops for Poughkeepsie at once. Very well. Give me the order. Don't yes. sign it, Your Excellency. I'm sorry, mistress. If William Prendergast leaves the custody of the king's officers and takes one step outside the jail door, there is absolutely nothing I can or will do. Your husband will hang. I won't let him. I won't let him leave. I promise thee. And thank thee for thy understanding heart. jail are lighted in the glare of torches. A surging mob of valley farmers surrounds the building. From the farmlands, up in the hills, and beyond the back roads, they've risen and come that night by wagon, by horse, and on foot, enraged and determined to set their leader free. Now you want me to stay here till I swing. Oh, no, my pigeon, not this time. William, I have a promise. Promise? From the governor. What do you mean? He'll have a pardon from the king. But not if he leaves this jail tonight. By heaven. Men, men, listen to me, men. Men, I'm not going with you. My wife here says the king will consider my pardon. But I'm not going to get into this any more violence. I think I'll stay in jail a little while longer until the pardon comes. So it'll be best if all of you'd go now. Thanks. Thank you, my friend. Heaven bless you all. Oh, hold me closely. Closer. There now. No more flying away from you over the land, my pigeon. You're in my arms now, and you'll stay here. Yes, William. I do love you. So it came to pass that through Mahitable's heroic ride for love of her husband, His Majesty the King of England granted Farmer William Prendergast his pardon. Tonight, that gallant woman of the days when America was just beginning its long struggle to achieve political and economic freedom takes her rightful place in the cavalcade of America. Thank you, Jeanette Nolan. And now before Dr. Monaghan tells us about next week's program, we have a story from the wonder world of chemistry. One day, a Swiss chemist named Brandenberger, employed by a rayon manufacturer in France, was annoyed by a dirty tablecloth in a restaurant. He thought how fine it would be to have a cloth so smooth that spilled food could be wiped off without leaving a trace. The idea struck him, why not coat fabric with a liquid cellulose compound used in making rayon? Well, he experimented a long time, but failed to produce a practical stain-proof tablecloth. 
Yet he did find that his solution could be made into thin sheets, which he thought might be good for wrapping packages. After years of work, he at last got what he wanted, a flexible cellulose film that was transparent. Now, this film was so costly to make, it could only be used to wrap perfumes and other expensive items in the early days in France. In America, the DuPont Company, recognizing the need for a packaging material that would allow people to see the product underneath, yet protect it at the same time, bought the rights to the manufacturing process and the trademark cellophane. Still, with all its advantages, this early cellophane lacked important properties. So DuPont chemists finally succeeded in developing an entirely new type, moisture-proof cellophane. Here, for the first time, was a transparent material that sealed freshness in and kept contamination out, thus filling a real need. From the very beginning, growing demand made it possible to bring the price down time after time. Just a few weeks ago, DuPont announced the 20th price reduction on cellophane. Today, because of continued research, the plain type is a much better product and costs only about one-eighth as much as when first manufactured here. The moisture-proof type has been reduced at an even faster rate. DuPont now has factories in three different cities busy making cellulose film, and another plant is being built. But that is only a small part of the new business created by this industry that sprang from the test tube. Think of the range of products, from pies to pianos, wrapped in this material. Think of the many articles made with it, from clothes bags to Christmas trees. Think how much this means in added employment throughout the nation. Surely you will agree that cellophane is another fine example of the DuPont pledge. Better things for better living through chemistry. And now, Dr. Monaghan. In the fall of 1620, the Pilgrim Fathers first landed in New England. But not many of us know the full story of how the first New England settlers managed to survive. That is the subject of our program next week. Following our cavalcade custom, let me ask a question about next week's program. How did a kidnapping English sea captain help save the lives of the Pilgrim Fathers at Plymouth Rock? Thank you. the orchestra and musical effects as usual were under the direction of Don Vurian. Next week, Cavalcade of America will present the noted star of stage and screen, Mr. Sam Jaffe, in an original radio drama, The Strange Friend of the Pilgrim. This is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from the DuPont Company. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company.